It's Tuesday, December 8th, 2015. I'm Rim. I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights Tonight, Starwall and Res Publica. Kind of an odd combination there. Let's, Let's do this. So our friends uh, Laura and Scott have a huge party like once or twice a year. And we went this year over the weekend taking trains to get to and from Philly and all this business. But something astounding happened. Scott, our friend Chase, and I, on the way home, were standing at a SEPTA station, you know, like a light rail station, <laughs> waiting for the train to take us to Philly so we could take our respective buses. Is it and actually a light home. rail? It's more like commuter rail, I guess. But it's just the train isn't very long. I mean, you know what it's but like? It's, just a, it's a full-size train. It's I like a slow metro north. Didn't go that slow. It went slow until it got out of the like one track area at least. I don't know. But it was uh, so we're standing there. It's like a, like this train would fuck you up if it hit you. That's that's. Yeah, you, I mean, there is no train on Earth, even the lightest rail. Uh, an HO scale train would not fuck you up if it hit you. Dude, it would still hurt if it hit your foot. You'd be like, ow. <laughs> <laughs> so we're standing there, especially if it's going full speed. And Chase points out and says, "Hey, isn't that car stopped on the train tracks?" And we look up, and sure enough, there's this woman sitting in a car, like just parked on the train tracks, like, waiting to turn left or whatever. Well, yeah, because, you know, it's like you pull out, you know, because you people pull out into the intersection to make a left. They block the box, and then they go. And in the city, when you block the box, well, you're in the box. But in the suburbs, usually you block the box, then the light turns green, and then you go. Yeah, so... And the train comes by how often? It's like, you don't really Except believe. those trains came by every, uh, like, 20-ish minutes. Actually, less than 20 minutes, because there's one one way and then one the other way. Yeah, but I guess, you know, you don't... You know, and when you drove your car everywhere... How often, when you came across a train crossing, was there actually a train? Real often, but I grew up in a place in the Midwest where there's a lot of freight tracks that just go across the streets. I mean, I think I've waited in my car for trains to go by maybe like three times ever, maybe only twice. All right, I waited for a train almost once a week. Mm. That's just where I grew up. Mm. And the stuff to trains, they're going like not like pretty often. Yeah. But so anyway, this woman's sitting there and she's like, hey, wouldn't it be funny if she's got hit by the train? And we're just being jerks and laughing. and kind of hoping she would get hit by the train. And then... We hear, the train, we hear the train noises, and then the gate comes down be behind her, and the other gate comes down. The train's coming, and she's just sitting there, like, fucking around on her phone. Mm -hmm. So I'm, like, walking over, like, kind of, like, because it's, like, right there, and I see bit by bit, like, everyone on the I'm train. Ready to, I'm getting my phone ready so we can get some work. Everyone stuff. on the train platform is, like, kind of watching, and like, oh, what's going on? A bunch of people nearby start honking. She still doesn't notice. Finally, I hear someone near her says, what the fuck? Starts screaming at her. And suddenly she looks up and looks at the train, and the train is blaring its horn at this point and bearing down on her. Train and she's stopping. <laughs> yeah. She floors it suddenly after she, like, freaks out, mm -hmm. drives through, stops, and then looks around and then drives away, probably embarrassed, as fast as she can. I mean, you know, in the Scott world, you lose your driver's license forever, never allowed to drive again ever anywhere. Yeah. And so, also, you wouldn't have been allowed to drive in the first place because you wouldn't have passed the driving test. So Lady gets a couple of strikes for that. But what makes the story astounding is that 100% of the trains that came by had a similar thing happen. You mean the one other train that came by? Yes, two trains. The next train that came, the train that we were going to ride on, comes up, and again, there was a car stopped, and the gate comes down behind him, doesn't notice right away, and then floors it and gets out of the way. But he did get out of the way, like... A l way faster than Yeah, like person. 30 seconds earlier than the other lady did. I was pretty much expecting to have to run over there and like see if someone was alive. Yet another reason not to live in the suburbs. Yeah. Cities only. Also, was, this city only. It was just remarkable to me that 100% of the trains that can't, that were coming by almost hit a car because people don't know how to drive in Pennsylvania. They should, I'm telling you, we just need to have... The problem is, is that people you know, can basically skirt the edge of danger without actually getting punished. Right, it's sort of like if you got a, you're standing on top of a mountain, or like you know, like maybe a mesa, right? It's flat on top. Yep. And you can you can be safe standing in the middle, and you can be safe tap dancing on the edge as long as you don't actually fall. Yeah. You, nothing will bad will happen to you. But you know so what? So then people just tap dance on the edge all the fucking time. But it's not just that; it's people tap dance on what the we edge just who do, have never had a tap dancing lesson. Sure. And what we should do is, if someone's tap dancing on the edge. We should not allow them to get lucky and not fall. We should just push everyone who is standing on the edge. <laughs> right? It's like if you I would not push them, I would pull them back, put a little fence and say you can't go past the fence anymore. That works too, but you know, shooting them with a gun, it's like you're forcing <laughs> <Okay>. All <laughs> right. <laughs> just if you want to skirt death, 
then uh, I you believe get, make the consequences Scott, go from low, you know, from like when there's a situation. The actual a, technical term for this is shaking hands with danger. Right. We should basically, when someone is shaking hands with danger, Shake we should hands make with it danger. so that 100% of the time they get bit. Then people will stop shaking hands with danger because or, they know that getting bit is a guaranteed thing and or not everyone, some, oh, I'll be safe this time. So I would argue that by your, if we go your way, then everyone who gets bit dies and there's no one who survives to tell the tale of the barbarian who came and killed everyone. That's not true. For example, this is my, like, I, you know, people always hold the subway doors open and I'm like, let's just put buzz saws on the inside of the subway doors. <laughs> See, so if you put is, your hand in there, you lose your hand. Scott, this is Nobody where you... Nobody will freaking put their hand in this there. This is where you are an extremist and I am merely a radical because you say buzz saws, I say tasers. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with the buzz saw? <laughs> <laughs> I would just go back to the old subway doors that would literally crush you. <laughs> But crushing delays the train. The buzzsaw means the train can just go with your you know, hand on board. You know, I did notice board. today. I, was just, I thought about something. Or your never... body on board and your hand on the platform. Today, because the 7 train was like s- delayed, so the entire platform was full of people. Mm-hmm. So I thought of something that I never really, like I don't think of consciously because I'm used to living in New York. So I'm standing on the edge of the platform. And the train's coming. And of course, I'm just like, the platform's completely full of people. I can't move. Mm-hmm. And the train's going by at a high speed, like two inches away from my face. Yeah. And... I was just standing that's there reading the Kindle. In, that's why I don't stand in the yellow area. Yeah, but yeah, I, I kind of had to. I couldn't have gotten on the train. <laughs> so Get on the next one. Uh, there was trouble. I would not have been home if I had not forced my way onto that train. Don't but I take digress. that train. Use a different one. I tap dance on the edge of the Mesa, but I have at least had a few tap dancing lessons. Or at least <laughs> I continue to tap dance safely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've you never just keep going skiing. You know what? I have never parked my car on fucking train tracks. <laughs> like, but you go skiing. It's pretty I feel much like, the same. I feel like rule What's one of driving a car is anytime you stop it, just look to the left and just see if you're on train tracks. <laughs> <laughs> like, at least make sure. Just like, make sure your hand I, is not in a toaster. I mean, I never had to look left to see if I'm on train tracks because I look ahead and see railroad crossing signs and I yeah. don't go across them. But at least you went through, like, you have this mental model of, all right, I'm stopping my car. Am I on train tracks? No. <laughs> okay. So anyway, you got any gaming news? I do have a gaming news. So, uh, if you don't know, it's Hanukkah. Oh shit! Time for some light festivals or magic oils and lakas, which is the real oil. Yeah, unrelatedly, the real the, magical oil. There's a menorah over the entrance to my building. It had white lights mm-hmm. when I came in this morning, and then when I left, it was the same menorah with blue lights. That's nice. Yeah. Just cool. Cool. I fancy, noticed that fancy menorah. Yeah. Anyway, so. Uh, if you, I don't know how much everyone listening knows about Jewishness, but on Hanukkah, <laughs> <laughs> but on Hanukkah, there's actually you know a game that goes with Hanukkah. Unlike a lot of other holidays, which don't have their own games, <laughs> nah. Hanuk- Hanukkah has an official game, uh, which is great for nerds. And the game is dreidel. And what is dreidel? If you don't know, it's a top. Like you spin it, you know, like top. It's man a D four in Mega Man Three. It's a, it's a four sided die. It's effectively a D four. <laughs> uh, one side, and basically the way it works is you have some pool of chips or goodies or candy or money gelt or whatever it is actual money actual whatever and when you spin it if you get a a gimel which is g you you (laughs) fucking get everything right if you get hay you get half if you get none you get bupkis and uh if you get the other one what's the other one shin maybe i don't know i think it's shin you lose half right so it's really uh in the words of our friend Joshua, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Dreidel is an awful game. <laughs> like, I'd rather play Monopoly. Yeah. so It's on the level of war. So he made this post, and it says, uh, let's fix Dreidel. Jewish game designers, let's get on this. <laughs> <laughs> this is so great. So here's the rules for the uh, fixing Dreidel, I guess. is I don't know if you even know this is a contest, but here's the rules for designing a game to fix Dreidel. So... Uh, have the dreidel has to be in the name of the game, and it has to feature the dreidel centrally, if not entirely. It has to be playable with a reasonable number of dreidels, from one to I don't know a dozen or something. <laughs> <laughs> the number you might have in your box of Hanukkah stuff. Uh, it has to obey all the mitzvah and the minhagim. All right, it's a bunch regarding the chag, chag, yeah, chag, you, right. So basically, if you don't know the. Uh, What's trash? Okay, so when you let's say you're a rabbi, <laughs> okay, and somebody asks you a rabbi kind of question, 
You know, like, like, Rabbi, can I eat this kind of thing on this particular? Well, more like, Rabbi, why do we, what is the meaning behind, you know, this particular I'm thing here? I'm thinking Simpson's not Rabbi. Should I buy a Ford or a Chevy? Ra- no, not that kind of Rabbi. So, basically, what the Rabbi will do is, depending on who you are, he'll give you a different kind of explanation, right? There's the explanation that he would give to somebody who's like, you know, intelligent, adult, knows a lot of Torah shit. Right. You know, the real explanation, you know, and then there's the explanation for the common person that he's going to give probably <laughs> to like, you know, someone who only comes in the high holiday or a goyim. Right. It's so like the science equivalent of wash your hands because I said so versus wash your hands because they're covered in bacteria. Yes, exactly. So, you know, you want basically you got to, you know, have some uh, religious action going on, you know, you know, some meaning to your game. So, wait, so what's related what's, to what's Hanukkah? K- what's Chag? Chag? Hmm? What's Chag? I'm not sure. Okay. So anyway, <laughs> one one of them is I I don't know. Anyway, uh, use only things that family is likely to have around on Hanukkah. Don't make them go out and buy. Yep, something already in. burning candles, oil lamps, drunk adults. Right. Uh, it has to be playable by everyone. Right. You can't be having some game the little kids can't play. Uh, anyone old enough to clumsily spin a dreidel. Right. Uh, it has to be playable by someone who's smart and someone who can't be like a game where it's, you know, the kids can play, but the adults are like, oh my God. Quote, screwed. mature kids who can develop strategies, weigh risks, and do other mature adult-like behaviors. Right. Be playable by adults of a much shorter attention span than kids and need to be entertained with systems like deal-making, ribald puns, cost-benefit analysis, and drinking. Uh, and it has to be, you know, public domain game. So yep. this prize is here. Uh... First prize, in retrospect, centuries from now, this will be how everyone has always played dreidel. It will be an obvious minhag that every child learns. Second prize, in retrospect, centuries from now, this will be how everyone has always played dreidel, but everyone knows that lots of people play it wrong. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, uh, if you can design a game around dreidel, or, I mean, any game you can design for D4s and put on a Hanukkah theme is going to meet the, the criteria. Yeah. I mean, think of it this way. The, the best way to prove your metal as a game designer is to set some arbitrary constraints and try to make a simple game that meets a bunch of parameters within those constraints. Right. So, Dreidel Game Design Contest. Uh, I expect... Make it happen. ...good ideas in the forum. Like I, I want to see what you guys I, come up I with. I can't come up with anything. I kind of came up with a role-playing mm-hmm. game, but it's like a cut-down version of the can't sword that a uses role, D4. It can't be a role-playing Why game. Why not? Yeah, role playing game doesn't you can't do that. What you Why gonna can't it are you be? Gonna be what? Some one person, Judah McAvee, the other person. <laughs> <laughs> Still working out the details. <laughs> so, uh, in other news, this is kind of relevant to geek nights and also gaming in a general sense. So, uh, this article talks about how linguists have identified an accent or a dialect or some combination that seems to exist pretty much entirely. On YouTube and Twitch channels, which in retrospect makes a lot of sense because there was a lot of evidence that once TV became standard, I mean, that's when the standard American Midwestern generic neutral accent became the media accent. Because suddenly, as TV became more and more national, most people were hearing voices on a regular basis that were like this default, like you sort of melded together into a generic accent. So unless you have a very strong regional accent that you also hear, you'll eventually drift toward this common one, like generation over generation. The internet is interesting in that communities of people are continuously sharing podcasts and YouTube videos and Let's Plays, and this article talks about what the YouTube accent looks like, and it's kind of fascinating because Scott and I both do a lot of these things, as do most of our podcaster friends, almost every Let's Play person I've ever seen who's popular, and actually uh, Crash Course. All those guys, they do this so close to the way it's described that it's uncanny. Mm-hmm. So I'd recommend you read this. I mean, basically what it comes down to, and you can read the article, get all the details, and there's a bunch of follow-up stories and everything, but the components are, one, overstressed vowels. So, like, instead of making a schwa, you'll say the syllables, and the vowel syllables at least, very strongly in words you say. You won't kind of, uh, the syllables. Like, exactly, instead of exactly, or exactly. Mm-hmm. Like, you'll stress all those bits along the way. Yep. Sneaking extra vowels in between consonants. So instead of trapping, they'll actually, you'll hear the sort of terrapping. You'll hear this eh uh, coming in, like splitting up the bits. Mm-hmm. There's technical terms for all this, but I don't know shit about linguistics, so I'm not even going to try. No. Nope. A lot more long vowels, uh, long consonants as well. 
and actually lots of aspiration and plosives. So people who need pop filters tend to be the kinds of people who do this accent by default. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because the accent, it was described variously as uh, intellectual used car salesman voice or (laughs) educated carnival barker. (laughs) But after I read this article, I went and watched a whole bunch of Let's Plays and everything. And I started hearing it. I started noticing it. I started hearing it in both of us. And it, it seems like the, what this accent does is it creates this sense that the person speaking knows more about what they're talking about than they might. That they're speaking. I thought that that's uh, any accent from the UK, but only when used in the US. Ah, uh, that is also true. But it also <laughs> includes enough patter and padding in things. Except, to where... for, except for Chav accents. <laughs> And but to where and pikey, where no one understands the what you're conversation saying. sort of keeps going, and pregnant pauses are not interrupted by someone expecting to ask a question or talk to you, but get that TED talk style sort of like the pause means what they just said was really profound. <laughs> and I just think this is fascinating, and I encourage you all to read this. And if you're going to do a podcast and you don't have radio training. I don't know. Just read this article and try to do those things and listen to what other people do. I don't think it's something you can do constantly. I, I mean, consciously. I think the way you acquire this is just by watching a lot of YouTube and then making a lot of YouTube, and it'll happen without you even knowing it happens. Will kids growing up watching Let's Plays all the time have that accent more so than their parents' accent? Just in everyday life? Yeah. They're all trying to sell each other. Like, yeah. <laughs> Is what talk to the teacher in car salesman voice. Step right up, check this homework here. Got an A plus, A plus coming through. <laughs> but it's also that it's an accent that typically in the past was only seen in people who are lecturing to an audience. But now that that sort of lecturing to an audience style is so common in pop culture, well, the only time you'll talk to people is to lecture to them. Uh, yeah, that's <laughs> what I think means. Otherwise, dollar. you'll just type at them if it's a conversation. I mean. Come on. <laughs> But anyway, things of the day. This is just an animated GIF, but it is so delicious. I mean, it's a good GIF, but Rim is going way crazy over it. It, it just as Boop. you watch this, imagine that the rocket, in fact, has sentience and a malevolent intelligence, and that it has decided to do this of its own will. Because it's just a bottle rocket. It's not a bottle rocket. Well, it's, it's a, a model rocket. rocket. It's like a model rocket. But dude, it just hits the igniter, and just as he's hit it. It starts falling That igniter over. cord is way shorter than we used yeah. to use. We used to use way longer ones. But it's falling so forward directly toward him just as he has ignited it. Mm-hmm. And there's the moment of, oh, I think shit. It's, I think what's actually happening is that the cord is so short, he pulled on the remote, which is what pulled it towards him. Yeah, but there's no motion there unless it was cut off. You can't the see gift. the cord because it's so low res. It, right? But his hands do not move. That's, I don't know. It might have just fallen. I mean, I've had model rockets... Fall just because those it's things definitely are super possible. Flimsy. It doesn't matter. The but, point is, it got hit him in the butt. Blink. Yes, the sublime moment of the, there's the peripatia where he realizes what is happening immediately and is doing what any human being would do, <laughs> and then the rocket reaches out and just bops him on the butt. Get longer cord next time. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, uh, some of the model rockets I had back in the day before I had an electric ignition system, you'd light a fucking fuse. I've never used a non-electric ignition system The electric system ones for a came model later. Rocket. For a model rocket, I've never used the non-electric. Were you a Quest kid or an Estes kid? Uh... I never did it myself. I always did it at like summer camp or school or whatever, right? So whatever that they bought. So sometimes it was one and sometimes it was the other. Ah. At Nerd Summer Camp, it was the best because they just had the catalogs fucking there. And the way it would work is first you'd have to go in and make some shitty little wizard rocket to prove that you could make a rocket. Which wizard that basically involves literally glue a tube to some fins, stick a cone in the top, yeah, tie yeah, one the, string most between of the, the inside. Most of the time was painting it, right? Yep. But anyway. Spray paint. Pfft. So once you made, well, you, yeah, once you made the wizard and proved that you could make a Actually, rocket. Actually, the wizard came pre-painted, I think. No, it did not this one. Anyway, once you made a wizard, all right, uh, I don't know if it was actually a kit, right? Is they just had yeah, it's, 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 it's got it's not the wizard. The wizard is the famous Estes rocket, right? But the point it it was basically right. They didn't. It was you know it was like a model rocket hut, and they just had tons and tons of fucking oh, no, supplies. You're right. You're right. You have to paint it and then put the decals right. on it. But they didn't give you the kit. You just basically made. You took a cardboard tube that was wizard sized, and you took some fins out of the box, right? And you, you, they didn't have kits. They just had stuff. 
So you made the rocket, right? And once you've leveled up enough, you know, making different rockets, they would let you just sort of do whatever the fuck you wanted as long as they would, like, look at your plan and be like, okay, you can do that. That's not going to kill Three anybody. stages, three G engines each, metal They're, nose Right, gone. so then on the last, twice during camp, right, because eight-week camp, at the end of the fourth week and the end of the eighth week, they would do model rocket day where everyone just sit on the lawn and launch every rocket. And at the beginning of the day, no one would go because it was just like wizard, 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 wizard. Yeah. Right. But then once he got past lunchtime, it was like, all right, Johnny's two stage is coming. Oh, and you'd see they'd have all the rockets set up on the lawn that were waiting to launch. And you would see like at the end of the line, this kid had one that was like, like a one foot circumference tube. Yup. <laughs> and it's just like, you're just waiting for the good shit. Depending on where you grew up, engines went up to G instead of just D. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is in the middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania summer camp of nerds. So, like, some kids would make ones that had, like, not stages, but like a bundle of four rockets at the bottom. Yup. I made some of those. Oh, I made one that was multiple stage with that. You had people with, like a double parachute setup going on, all kind, you know, fins in the middle. I lost three quarters of any of the rockets I ever made. Right. You know, but you know, that was a good day. Anyway. Anyway, yeah. uh, my thing of the day. So sometimes at a sporting event, you know, there's people on the field, especially when it's a televised sporting event or, or rink or court or whatever field of play uh, who have microphones on them for various reasons. Maybe they're communicating with their coaches or other players. Maybe they're, you know, maybe they're refs and they need to talk to the whole, you know, uh, people in attendance or they need to talk to the television or Maybe they just mic'd up some players you know, so they can hear the quarterback going like, Blue 22, whatever. And on occasion, intentionally or unintentionally, uh, you hear things on those microphones, being a spectator either in the stands or at home watching on television, that you were not supposed to hear, you you know, shouldn't be hearing or are unusual to hear because you're not on the field of play. That's not a place yep. that you experience now, as, not a, like as you, a spectator. Not like one fan just happens to be close to one of the mics and, like, you hear that no, guy yell a lot. No, things the players, refs, or coaches are saying. Yeah. Now, this happens relatively frequently. There was an incident very recently uh, at an ice hockey game. And here, my thing of the day, is a compilation video of some of the best times that this has happened. Uh, over the years, and it's a very recently made video, so it includes that very recent incident. Uh, actually, quite a few incidents from just the past few weeks, uh, as well as many from over the years. Many classics. I've seen, I'd already seen about at least more than half of these, but there were still some that were new to me. I imagine most will be new to you. In the meta moment, the book of the book was the wheel of time. I'm on like book seven. I know stuff. Just Scott's I on book stopped five. reading, and I yeah. did not pick up since we last mentioned. Yep, so I'll probably do a new book club soon, but might just burn through the rest of these books. Like, I'm kind of just churning through them at this point. You're not even halfway done. Even book I know, seven. but at the Aren't same there time. are like 13 books or something like that? 14, I think. Okay. So I'm about halfway. <laughs> I just got to kill time before the next Prince of Nothing book comes out. <laughs> but we Must kind of kill time, boy. Must <laughs> cherish it. <laughs> Can I get five bucks to go get loaded? <laughs> so we can officially announce we have at least two panels at PAX South 2016. And I'm definitely going because I bought a plane ticket and I reserved a hotel room. And man, is it cheap. Yeah, it is Whoa, cheaper it's cheap. for us to, from us in it's New so York inexpensive. to go to PAX South, like in total, than it is to go to PAX East in Boston. Well, not if you count the time, but... You know, the money cost is Yeah, the lower cost than of the flights, not much more than Amtrak to Boston. And hotel, listen, PAX, less than half what it costs for a hotel right, in Boston. PAX South, as far as I know, is not sold out. Uh, it is not. As the other PAXs are. So it's like, if you want to go to PAX and you can't go to East or Prime or whatever, even if you freaking live in Seattle or Boston, it'll probably be cheaper for you. Also, that convention go. center is great. There's great it's okay. food it's there. Not, it's not great. It's okay. I'm going to put it this way. If I were running a convention, the I'd... food is decent. It's I would better rather than have it, East food. I would rather have it in that facility, if I could have the facility, independent of the things around it, than any of the convention centers in Boston. Uh, Sure. Yeah. But anyway, on Saturday, January 30th at 1 p.m. in the Bobcat Theater, we are doing Atari Game Design. And on Sunday, it's Rim's idea. January 31st at 1 p.m. in the Bobcat Theater, the exact same time and place the next day, designing game rules. All righty. Uh, it's going to be good stuff. I may or may not be on a third panel uh, without Scott because Scott doesn't care about the topic, but that is to be seen. If that happens, it'll be Saturday after the Atari game design panel. 
Hmm. Uh, I'll be playing games the rest of the time. Yeah, we're going to be at MAGFest. Between the two of us, we're on like six or seven panels. Uh, I assume PAX East, Anime Boston, PAX Prime, and then <laughs> back around. And of course, the Patreon is still live. We're getting close to our first stretch goal. So uh, yeah. That's all you. Keep pushing, guys. And submissions are open for the December Q&A. And we already got three questions, two of which are really good questions. And also I learned The third is not a good question? Eh. So here's what I've learned so far. Everyone who has asked the question has seen Monty Python and the Holy Grail, and most of them have memorized the script. I was just curious. How do we know this? Because they said so. They might be lying. I put a poll question what, in each what one of these. What nerd hasn't seen it? I'm curious. And two, you know the red envelope, white envelope thing you suggested? Literally no one who has submitted a question knows what the fuck I'm talking about. Okay. So that tells us that people who are our Patreon patrons either they, don't go they, to PAXs. They don't even watch PAX on Twitch. Or if they go to PAX, they don't go to the keynote and the Q&A. Like, they don't know. They don't know. <laughs> yeah. Because the, the options... Or they haven't gone recently. The, the, the poll choice I put was, is this a red envelope question? And the answer choices are yes, no, WTF is a red envelope question. We haven't had a red envelope question, and it would be hard to ask one. Yeah. I mean, those are questions... What that, red envelope question could you even ask me? Uh, I could think of ones they could ask us that would be pressing and you know stuff about family about uh diseases and illness about what do you tragedies. Know? i don't i don't know i don't want to know i'm saying someone might have a weird what does uh, anyone want to know i mean the thing is we don't have kids so it's not like you know a lot of people when they ask mike and jerry the like red envelope questions it's always like something intimate about raising your kids right so the answer is either okay i'll tell you or mind your own fucking business yeah that's the answer. So you can't red envelope me <laughs> <laughs> you were the one who said we should have a red envelope white envelope system so i did it yeah. And so far, it's they're all WTF is a red envelope. <laughs> <laughs> so, at this party that I talked about before, the aforementioned party, where we almost, after which we almost saw the people die in their cars hit by trains, we the, the king of the day, other than board games, was <laughs> local multiplayer games on an HTPC. Like, that shit was rocking for the entire party without cease. Yes. I mean, this isn't, some, you know, this isn't someone who owns a uh, X-Bone or PS4. Right? And neither do I. He has a GameCube no, and a Wii, but that, no one was yeah, playing no, those. No Wii U, right? Um, their DSs weren't get, coming out for whatever reason. I asked if I should bring my DS, but I realized that no one ever wants to play Smash with me. No one ever wants to play Advance Wars with me. No one wants to play Mario Kart with no me. No one wants to play Dr. Mario with me. I'll play that with you if you'll play any of those other games with me. No. Well, <laughs> well then. Uh... So, and, you know, the, all the good multiplayer-type games are Wii GameCube types for local multiplayer. We, when we were limited to the selection of Steam, and these, you know, I mean, we didn't try the entire Steam library of local co-op games, but so many of the games were two-player local co-op, so those are ruled out, you know? And or otherwise, local multiplayer, not necessarily co-op. Right, because otherwise you could play, like, Rocket League, or you could play uh, Resident Evil. Like, there's a lot of two-player co-op Resident Evils. Like, I think all of them since five are yeah. local, right? But if you have so, like, if you want four people to play a game together, there's a lot of options on Steam, and most of them are not good games. Right. Even if they're competitive or cooperative, it didn't really matter. Local multiplayer games with, with more than two players on in the Steam library were hard to come by, and when we did find them, they were often bad. Yep. Now, half of them were bad because the games are bad, and half were bad because they just like didn't support controllers right, or the menus were incomprehensible, or just the game wouldn't go full screen, or all sorts of weird nonsense. Yep. But two games stood out. I and mean, we just opening up Long Live the Queen and just discussing as we played was more fun than many of these actual multiplayer games. Even though we didn't make it. I, I was interested to go down the road of let's be a badass swordswoman. Never gone down that road before. Yeah. We failed every the, single test except for the one. <laughs> yup. <laughs> so the, the one game that basically lasted about half the party, and we've already talked about it, is the Jackbox games. That is like... We did a whole episode on them. They're still great. They're always great. That is party game A++++. And everything else was not A++. <laughs> Though, I just want to point out, almost everyone who's playing the Jackbox games was like super into it and loving it. But there was one person, I won't name a name or anything, this person was playing, I think, Fibbage, and halfway through, they were like, I'm, like they were uncomfortable and did not like the game and were hoping it would end and never wanted to play it again. We're really salty about playing it. 
What? Which was interesting. How could he be salty playing Fibbage? I don't know, but there was someone who was very salty about Fibbage, and there were a couple people who got I, who I overheard got a little salty about the drawful one because they can't draw, which is weird. I can't because draw either. I'm the, I not only can I not draw, I negative draw. Yeah. And yet that game is great. But I digress. That was 50% of the play. The other half was Starwall. People were going crazy about well, this Star game. Well, Starwall is a game I knew about a long time ago, mostly because I don't know where I saw it on the internet, but I remember sending it to Rim when I discovered it, like, hey, Narwhals, yep. check Narwhal- this game. Why don't you play this game? I it's- didn't know anything about it other than that. It was sort of one of those sort of indie, local multiplayer type of games. It's Narwhals plus Nidhogg. Yeah. Pretty that, much. Well, now that we played it, right, we finally got around yeah. to playing it at this party. So... People, like this game, people kept rotating in and out playing it for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours, yelling and screaming and disrupting the German board games we were trying yeah. to play. I mean, I played it a bit and it was fun for a bit, but then I was done with it. I'm not done with it. I really like it. And I kind of got good at it the more I played it. Yeah, I mean, it's clearly a game where you can get good at it. There is some skill going on, but it's like the skill ramp was like, it seemed like it, the skill ramp wasn't a bad ramp, poorly shaped. But it sent like the first bunch of steps were not steps of learning skills, but instead dealing with controls that are intentionally bad or accidentally. I see. I actually don't some think combination of intentionally and accidentally bad. It's interesting because I actually don't think they're bad. I think they're very intuitive. What I noticed was people who kept asking like, "How do I turn? How do I move? How do I whatever?" Couldn't understand the game. Like wanted them to explain like it's how to asteroids move. Asteroids controls, but they're wobbly and limited. Well, what it is is that you can kind of direct your narwhal, starwhal, I guess, and you can hold A to kind of accelerate. And if you wiggle your body right, you can kind of go faster. You've just got your sword point on the end of your narwhal, and you're trying to stab the other narwhals in the heart. Right. So I didn't realize the heart part right away. We didn't like study the rules. We just started playing immediately. Yep. And I was, thought I just had to stab other narwhals. I didn't realize there was this heart I had to stab. I've them noticed in. a lot of people who are bad at laser tag have the same problem. They think because they don't know how anything works in the world that you just shoot the other person. <laughs> like they don't realize you have to shoot that one spot on their body. That pack. actually can detect yeah. that they got shot. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But this, I, it wasn't that I, you know, was too dumb. It's just I didn't see it. Right? Well, so that, that, you know, and that's I just kinda, lost. I'm like, why did I lose? That's kind of an aside because I noticed something. The games where you had to look at the controls and like really think about them or you could not play at all tended to be the worst of the games we tried on Steam. Mm-hmm. And the games like this where like you could pretty much play it okay by looking at zero I mean, rules, as soon as someone told me about the heart, I was like, oh, okay, I didn't need any more rules explanations. But you know, the rest was intuitive. I mean, basically you fly around and it's all around using the physics and dueling and trying to like maneuver yourself to where you can hit the narwhal in their heart without getting hit with yourself. Your, with your narwhal pointy tooth. Yeah, which is extra interesting because your heart's only on one side of your body and you're playing in a two-dimensional space where you can kind of rotate freely. Right. Now, the one thing that I didn't that was I found out as we played that was kind of annoying is that when you start the game, your narwhal is facing either to the left or to the right, depending on your spawn location, and you can never flip your narwhal to face the other way which ever i think is fine well i mean it's not necessarily because good or bad because the game bad, is a four it's, player it's a, or a two player game never play this three player if you like, play with three players you'll have two perhaps left facing narwhals and one right facing but as one. we've talked about in the past three player competitive games that are not races are usually bullshit right and this would have that same problem right but i mean so if it's two on two though but then you've got these different you got like three different ending situations right you got the lefty lefty the righty righty and the mixed you know, final confrontation between two narwhals. But it also means... That all play differently based on, you know, which of those three it happens to be. It also means that two of the narwhals favor one area of the board and two of the narwhals favor another area right. of now, the, the board. Right, now the reason for this, you think if your narwhal was symmetrical, then it wouldn't matter. But your heart is on the bottom of your narwhal, which means if, you flip, if you're a right-facing narwhal, that means, so you're facing to the right, you can hit people to the right, and your heart is on the ground because there's gravity on most of the maps. Yep. I mean, just relatively, that's a protected position when you're facing to the right. If you flip over because you want to stab someone to your left, then suddenly your heart is facing up and is exposed. So that's why there's a righty-lefty thing going on. Yep. But the thing is, you can't, well, one, I would say, I'd give strategy or talk about, like, oh, well, you can't just lay there because then you won't Obviously, win. Obviously, you can't just lay there. But be really dumb. The game does something very well. It has the old Atari Ortho game 
thing where there are a million different modes. Yep. And some of them are and better the than others. And maps are different. Yep, there's then... a ton of different maps. So the game is always just novel enough to keep anyone who's playing it casually from getting good enough to dominate everyone else and have the air hockey problem. Yeah, you can play stock, you can play time, you could, like, I was getting a lot of kills, but I was losing because I was, you know, in my offensiveness, I was also taking hits. Yep. And I'd be, like, the second one left alive at the end, and then I'd lose, but I had, like, set most kills or second most kills. Well, there's a most kills mode that doesn't care how many times you die, of course, except for the fact that when you die, you're giving someone else a kill. Yep. So you just distribute your deaths evenly among your opponents. Yeah. But <laughs> in our Hours and hours and hours of people playing. There were two people who played a lot more than everyone else. And they did get better than everyone else in showing that there was definitely skill involved. Yep. That could be learned and practiced. I like the game a lot, actually. And I kind of want to get it because I think it's a good game to play idly yeah. while you're waiting for other people to come and play a game. I think it's an okay party game, uh, but it's not so great that I would play it on my own or want to play it. or I kind of want to play late. it on my own to become good enough at it to do the Nidhogg. Sure, you can do that if you want, but yeah, uh, yeah it's uh, it doesn't it's not strong enough to interest me because it's just like the depth really isn't there. I think the depth is there. And you're just not gonna invest. It. It's like Smash Brothers. Definitely are you, not investing. Are you like focus cancel or whatever nonsense in Smash Brothers? No, but at least I can see. Even though I'm not going to do it in either game. In Smash Brothers or those kind of games, at least I can see the depth, right? It's it's like I'm swimming in a pool and I know I'm not diving deep, but I can see the bottom. In this game, it's like I look down and it's sort of dark, and I'm like, well, is it really shallow or deep? I can't even tell. See, I can and I'm see definitely the not swimming down there. I could see deeper, I think, because I definitely saw that there were very I think clear... I think I had to swim deeper to begin to see deeper, right? I guess I did swim a little deeper because I was playing it for a while again after the first time you played, mm. and I got kind of good, okay, like pretty quick. Until people started ganging up on me. Yep. <laughs> George was getting better than he should have. Starting to do politics yep. <laughs> in the yeah. four-player game. <laughs> yeah. See, what they really did, all you know, this reminded me, is that the game that we really need for this situation is Video Ball. That's the game. The, uh, no, the problem is, as much as I want it to be Video Ball, Video Ball is more like Rocket League Casual people sitting down to play but you, but will you can, do nothing but own goal, get pissed, and stop. But the one thing with video ball is you can do four player local, which Rocket League can't do easily, unless you got like four computers. And you know what I would say then? You bust out Star Walls if you have the barely gamers to semi serious gamers set at your party. Mm -hmm. And if it's all people like me and Scott, also and like the video crew, ball can totally work if no one is good at it. Same, no, the same with like no. Soul Calibur Street Fighter work if no one's good or Smash Brothers. I think video ball will work less good because video ball has a lot of own goaling if you suck. Maybe. Uh, I mean, I scored own goals and I have some basic gaming aptitude. <laughs> okay. I mean, I, I, they serve the same purpose. I think they're similarly competitive. The only real difference is that this is this can be a team game, but we were mostly playing it solo. Video ball is only a team game. Mm. I wouldn't play video ball one on one, just like I wouldn't play Rocket League one on one. Oh, that's -on -one. true. This is four. This Star Wall can be four players. Everyone's individual. Yes. Video ball has to be teams. It's more like Mario Tennis. So yeah, I was about to say I yeah. was aiming toward that. Video ball fits in the niche of Mario Tennis, and notice even in our group. It was hard to get Mario Tennis going because you needed teams to say, we will play this game as teams. Team Star Scott. Wall, Star Wall, Team Scott, what, with your boo? <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> Narwhal, Star Wall, can do the one-on-one-on-one-on-one -on -one -on -one -on -one where, like, everyone plays till someone gets bored and they hand controller over to someone else. And because no one, you know, only the host is going to own this game, most likely, no one's going to practice it at home and get good like they do at Smash. Yeah, it'd be hard to practice. Who are you going to practice Star Wars against at home? The AI? Yeah. It's like, I don't so even know. unless your friend group become this becomes your windjammers, it'll pretty much always be air hockey without the air hockey problem. Maybe. I mean, I enjoyed it. I think it's a great game. In the very the least... The theme is good. It's got that, you know, neon Geometry Wars kind of style that I like that a lot of indie games have. It's polished. But also narwhals. It's polished. And you can customize your narwhal before the game starts to really stand out. Like, yep. you, you know, and you, that way you can really identify who you are. But it's polished. It's consistent. It's well-designed. It has good aesthetics. It plays, like, easily. It's intuitive to the most... Controls might be a little flaky. I don't think they're flaky they're at all. They're not perfect. That's for I sure. Know, I don't think they're flaky. They're very consistent. <laughs> they're consistently not 
not perfect. They're not. No, no. Like flaky would be like some of those mediocre platformers. I where mean, like, they don't work. It's not. Yeah, it's not that bad. It's, it's not. Just, it's not one of those ones where you're just like, fuck this. The controls are so bad. They're just slightly like, eh. I don't think they're. Eh. I think they're, they're actually eh. really good. They're. Eh. I f- I felt like I had a lot of control on my Star Wall. Uh, and then not really. Let's <laughs> l- let's play some one on one. I think something might happen. I think I might just be way better at this game than you. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> uh, but the the theme of it being also narwhals. Yep. Uh, in space. Is but really it also great. it did everything you. If you want to be this like directly competitive single screen local or you know you could do this game online just as easily. But single screen ortho game in the style of old Atari competitive games. This game did that to a T. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, those games aren't all great. As long as you do the formula well, you'll succeed and you'll be a niche like slot racers. Mm. All right. So we have to talk about Res Publica because we put it in the title of the episode. Res Publica is a Kinesia game that I had never played until PAX. I never played it until this weekend. Yeah, Chris busts out and played we played it once, it. and that's all I need to play. I like it because no ga- the, cl- the only game I can think of that has a mechanic even close to this in terms of the mechanic that's interesting in this game is Hanabi. Yeah, but Hanabi's better by a lot. This is a game where there's two resources, and you're trying to build the most stuff by making sets right, of dudes. Right, there's two decks of cards. You have to make sets and succeed in the first deck of cards, and you can start getting cards from the second deck, and the second deck is actually worth victory points. So yes. it's pretty much build a machine, and then score, and then the game's over. But the mechanic, and this is all I want to focus on, the game itself, like it's it's... Play it if you're a game designer and you want to see how this works. This mechanic It's really is straightforward and simple and not really the greatest, but Well, it could be. It, just, it's basic it it's really nuance. just it's really just here's this game mechanic. Let's implement it in the simplest possible, most straightforward way and the end. But the mechanic is such. So think about games like Bonanza about games like I think Hanabi. Bonanza does it better. Hanabi no, I think Bonanza better. does it worse, but Bonanza's a more fun game. Maybe. Because there's no information economy in Bonanza, really. Not like the strict That's true. In Bonanza, you could just be like, yeah, I got 10 cool In fact, oh my, imagine mm-hmm. Bonanza if you use some of the ideas from this game. Maybe. You got to think on Anyway, so here's the mechanic. On your turn, you'll have a hand of cards, and you either say, I have something, or I want something. And you can so in saying that, you're giving information away. Obviously, if you say you have something, you have to have it. You can't say you have something you don't have. You can and all if you, you say can, you want something, well, that's the only thing that you could get. So clearly you must have something that goes with the thing you want in your hand, otherwise you wouldn't be saying that. So I offer a contract. I have two Langabarden. That means I will give you two Langabarden for whatever you offer. Right. So, so we go so clockwise. You so go around got, the table. So since Rim started with an I have, everyone else has to reply with an I have, right? So Rim said he has two Langabarden. I have two shift bow. And everyone else says, I have one shift bow. I have three cards. Yep. <laughs> and who cares what they are? Yep. And you go around, and then I can choose not to trade, or I can pick one of those deals and do it. So if he picks me, he has to give me two Langobard, and I have to give him two shift bow, because that's what we said that we had. Oh, yeah, the game, the we copy of the we game we have ne- is just in German. We so. can't negotiate, right? We have to do what we said was the thing. Yeah, it's, it's a very structured market. So if I say, I want... Then Scott would say, I want. Yeah, you have to reply to a want with a want and a have with a have. So if he says he wants a shift bow, I have to, A, have to have a shift bow. I can't say I want something if I don't have the shift bow that he wants. So to step it up a little further, you can have up to two clauses and an and or an or between them. So I could say, I want two shift bow or two Langobarden. So that means I can reply with a want, as long as I have either two shift bow or two Langobardens. And then I would say, I want something. So now, if we actually, Rim chooses me for the deal, it's up to me whether to give him the shift bows or the Langobardens. Yeah, so if because I Because I said or, I decide which of those ors I'm going to give. Yeah, so if I say, I have X or Y, fuck you. I'm, I don't, you, I don't, you don't get to pick which one. So I have or is kind of a dick deal. But you can use that to share yeah, information. Something I thought about immediately after playing that I never did during the game yep. was could I lie using an or? For example, I have one shift bow in my hand. Yep. Could I say I have one shift bow or one something I don't have? I can see from your hand. And then always hand, give the shift bow. Uh, no, you cannot. I'm reasonably sure. Mm. No one did that because I don't think you can. 
We can because check the rules. when I give him, if you give someone something after an or, you give it to them face down so that only you and they know what you actually gave and no one else does. So think about this. I might say something, you know, what, what, when I'm saying my haves and wants, I might have a part of the clause that is something I actually want to do, but I'm also trying to share information. Like I'm trying to impart, like say it's my turn and I offer something to Scott, I might also be saying something because I want Chris to offer me something on his turn. And I'm trying to share information without right, sharing too much information. You're negotiating without directly negotiating by saying that you want some. Like someone just says, you know, they have one something, and it's like goes around, and no one has anything. And then you're like, I want two of that something you just said you had one of. Yep. Yeah. But you got to be careful because if you share too much information, like if Scott keeps talking about how he has Langabar and is trying to get rid of him, and then suddenly Can he says, Can you look I up some more of the cards beside Langabarns and Shift Bows? Uh, Vikinger? Anglo Saxons. Anglo Saxons and Vikingers? Vikingers. Okay, there we go. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Shift Bow. Shift Bow. But. If Scott keeps saying, I have Langobarden, I have Langobarden, then suddenly he's like, I want Langobarden? Well, yeah, I'm not going to give, no one's going to give him fucking Langobarden now because he's going to make his set. Yeah. He suddenly got, like, by luck, close enough to be there to his set. So the game is a pretty rough game if you really play to win because you got to keep track of what people have and want based on these negotiated contracts and this information economy. It was too much for me to ever bother trying to do fully yeah i'm like at the beginning of the game i started to get a picture in my head of what were in people's hands and before it got around the table once i gave the fuck up so <laughs> information economy games but i would say if you're just a casual i ended gamer, up just like sort of associating one card with each player at any given turn yep well it's like in tne all i think about is for everyone else what do they have the least of and i try to keep track of that and i ignore everything else they have the least of the thing no one has any of yeah uh, <laughs> so do not get this game just as a general gamer. I'd honestly only recommend it if, one, you're a Rainier Kinesia fan, like you really just want to go through his uh, his works. Or this, if you're a game designer and you want to study this mechanic. Yes, if you're a game designer who is interested in information economies, because there aren't that many games that do it well, and I suspect information... Or if you're some sort of game researcher or something, yep. right? This information economy games are rare, and they might be a way to solve some of the problems of shitty co-op games like Pandemic. Right, but yeah, there's a lot you can learn from this game, but there's not a lot of fun that normal people could have playing this game, or anyone could have playing this game. It's like, I played it once, and I don't need to play it again, really. Yeah, I, so, I understand it now. So the third type of person to play it is if you're one of those people who's played every game, like, this is novel, and you'll get pure novelty from it because you haven't played a game like it before. Yeah, a few times. Yeah. I mean, some people have played, like, most of the games in the PAX library, and you're sitting there like, ah, what do I play that isn't Tigger's and Euphrates? Yep. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brando K for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night. And the patrons this week are... Nicholas Brandau, Rebecca Dunn, James David White, Christian Kuntz, Jess, Mechanical Mind, Testing 123, Phil Ulrich, Amanda Duche, Renee from New Zealand, Robert Lee, Ryan Perrin, Drew Oppenlander, Rare Lavelle, Brian Cedroni, Rochelle Montanona, Finn Eric Solverod, Rim Eats Poop. Kinetic Man, William Eisenrose, Aaron Cerise, Chris Midkiff, Chris Knox, Flame Darkfire, Samuel Cordry, Daniel Redman, Chris Haddad, Doug Snyder, Sean Klein, Chris Reimer, and Thomas Hahn. The only really important thing I can tell you guys is if you didn't notice, the poll for the December Q&A episode is up. You can go vote in that now. Submit your questions. And the November Q&A is already up, so if you haven't logged into Patreon in a while, 
make sure you log in because everyone who's giving us any amount of money can listen to that episode. And we talk about some pretty good stuff. It was actually a full-on real episode. So stay tuned for new stuff. A lot of things are in pre-production, and you heard about all the panels we're doing. And now I leave you with your moment of literally the opposite of Zen. What if it bumped that control by accident? You'd be mincemeat by now. What have I told you? You don't work on equipment when the engine's running. Well, I told him not to touch anything. All right, I guess I wasn't thinking. You weren't thinking? You mean you'll work on engines and machinery and not think of your own personal safety? Here, here, here. Shake hands with danger. thing involved here. Glenn doesn't want his friend to sneer at him for being overly cautious. So, Glenn shakes hands with danger. Danger.